Hello, and good day wherever you find yourself right now. I hope you're fully enjoying the conference so far. There's so much collective knowledge here, and I want to soak it all up. And given all the options you have, I'm grateful you chose to be with us today. I'm Dale Willman. I'm a longtime journalist and photographer, and I now serve as the Associate Director of the Resilience Media Project at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. I offer training about resilience issues for journalists around the world. The history of the modern environmental movement, at least in the United States, is clear. Oop, and we're going to try and get our slides working here. Sorry. There we go, because it's an important slide, I think, for all of you to see. So policymakers do not legislate for environmental change unless pushed to do so by the public. From the burning of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland in 1969, an incident that helped to coalesce the US environmental movement, to the Valley of the Drums near Louisville, Kentucky in the 1970s, it was media coverage of these events and others that led to legislative change. And the most compelling media came from the photographs. Good science can and does change the world, but generally it does not do so on its own. It also takes public support and understanding, and photos can go a long way toward fostering that support. Images give a sense of immediacy and offer a larger truth that resonates. Today, we're talking with three photographers whose work is centered on, among other things, the edges involved in managed retreats. We're going to talk today about the role photography can play by increasing public awareness and support for the work that you and others do. With us today is Virginia Hanusik. Ginny is an artist whose projects explore, uh, sorry, who explore the relationship between landscape, culture, and the built environment. Her work has been exhibited internationally, featured in the New Yorker, National Geographic, British Journal of Photography, Domus Places Journal, The Atlantic, and Oxford American, among others. She's also on the board of directors of the Water Collaborative of the Greater New, or of the, uh, Greater New Orleans, where she coordinates multidisciplinary projects on the climate crisis. Her current body of work examines flooding and the politics of disasters in the Mississippi River watershed. Michael Snyder is a photographer, filmmaker, and environmental scientist who uses his combined knowledge of visual storytelling and conservation to create narratives that drive social change. He's a climate journalism fellow at the Bertha Foundation, a Portrait of Humanity Award winner, a Blue Earth Alliance photographer, a National Geographic contributor, and a resident artist at the McGuffey Arts Center in Charlottesville, Virginia. Through his production company, Interdependent Pictures, he's directed films in the Arctic, the Amazon, the Himalaya, and East Africa. His journalism work has been featured by outlets such as National Geographic, The Guardian, the Washington Post, and many more places. And we're also joined by Dennis Demick. Dennis is a journalist, photographer, presenter, educator, and citizen of the Anthropocene, the age in which we're all in now. He served for years as executive environment editor for National Geographic Magazine, and was a picture editor for the National Geographic Society for more than 35 years until retiring in December, 2015. Dennis is interested in making visual the effects on Earth of humanity's expanding presence in the emerging Anthropocene epoch. He's written on these issues and at National Geographic guided several major magazine projects on this idea, including a September 2004 global warning issue with invisible climate change, which we all probably remember. Pretty much all of the major environmental stories you've enjoyed for years in National Geographic have Dennis's thumbprint on them in some way. So thank you all for joining us. Dennis, why don't we start off with you? Why should researchers even care about photographs in their work? Uh, well, uh, hi, Dale, Michael, and Jenny. Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you. So why should researchers care about photographs? I think it's the, the, where the value comes is in that it provides visual evidence. It allows uh, uh, if, if this is, these are meant as illustrations for research projects, I think that, that uh, clear, um, simple, direct documentation of what is at stake in the paper or the research is, is a very uh, clear way to be able to describe what you're doing. And it, it allows you to make connections with audiences, perhaps in ways that uh, words, uh, even uh, clear words, are are not going to. The photographs can have an immediate and also emotional, potentially emotional impact. 
And that's the key, isn't it? It's the emotional connection that images bring to people. And it, 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 when done well, it brings them in to the story, right? Well, there's a balance. I think that it, when you're talking about science, you have to first off make sure that the, the images are represent that are fact-based or are descriptive and outward looking so that they are actually representing accurately the issues at hand. But if there are ways for you then to bring in uh, emotional components, whether it's light composition uh, uh, or, or idiosyncrasies or perhaps even uh, elements of human emotion, those, those are the kinds of things that will uh, cause people who see photographs to become more engaged with them so that they have, uh, there's an aesthetic appeal in addition to the facts and the information. So I, I want to ask this of all of you. What's the role of photography? We've talked now more broadly about photography in general in the work. What, what's the role of photography specifically in documenting what's happening with climate change? Dennis, if you want to go first, we can go to Michael and Jenny. Uh, well, uh, why don't I show you a couple of things and then we can go from there. So uh, share screen. Yeah, you'd think we'd have this all figured out after a year of this, but. No, no worries. So you see the cover. So uh, early on, I think that was one of the biggest questions that we were trying to face was, uh, you know, how to how to show how to show the effects of climate change and the impacts. And the problem I think that we face uh, at the geographic and all of us as photographers and visual communicators is when you talk about climate change, you're speaking about change. And while this image of the Greenland ice sheet is showing a uh, disic equilibrium and that there uh, uh, is uh, ice melt, uh, the issue, it doesn't really show the change. And that was the challenge that we were trying to confront. For example, this is with photographer James Baylog, who then went on to do uh, the Extreme Ice Survey Project. This, this work in 2006 was the earliest, but see, so what we're doing here is trying to show change within a period of time. And if, and the camera positions were identical six months later, uh, you can see the recession within the same season. If you look at the horizon on the right, you'll see that the camera position is the same. Uh, we did a variety, he did a variety of these situations in the same year. You can see if you look uh, top right on the horizon, you'll see that the mat they match up. So that, that, was, that was very important to us. To, uh, we were using GPS to make sure that we were in the same spot. And then we, several projects later, then in 2013, when we did the 125th anniversary issue of the magazine, uh, Jim's work became uh, an article on evidence. Uh, the, we had a subhead there called Prove. And the point was to try to help people realize when you talk about climate change, then there is actual change. And so this was, these pictures were taken six years apart, the Columbia Glacier in Alaska in 2006, six years later. And then, th then we published them side by side. I would say that the multimedia aspects of like what we're using right now, where you can overlay images one against another in a, in a cinematic transition is very powerful. But when you're on the printed page, it's a little more difficult to make that, uh, that, that, that uh, effect. But also beyond just the change, you need to also try to, when we talked earlier about emotional impact, here we have, we're, we're looking at ice here that's thousands and thousands of years old and it's, it's going away. And so what we're trying to do more than just do the facts and, the, and sort of representing the change, we're trying to also speak to uh, um, the emotional aspect of the beauty of nature. And then I'll leave, leave you with this, I think in this instance, uh, sometimes perhaps maybe it's important to be provocative and the, and the, and the cover of this was for a, um, uh, another story that we did in, in, in 2013 um, after one of the hurricanes hit the East Coast. And so what we did was we based uh, uh, this assessment on if all the ice on the planet were to melt, how much would the seas rise? And so then you see the line uh, on the Statue of Liberty. We were trying to actually get people to pay attention. And by being provocative in the, on this way, uh, uh, we did get people to respond. 
So, that's... so it's it, it, it and it's it's interesting. And you've you've shown through your uh, images um, a point I want to make here, and and that is that a lot of research has been done now to show that uh, emotional appeals work, but also human connection. And Ginny and Michael, in both of your work, Michael, your the work I've seen of yours is very human focused. A lot of people in it, Ginny, there, at least the stuff I've seen has less human presence, human being presence, but you have humanity present. You have buildings, you have roadways, you have things that that show that presence of of humanity. So, Michael, why don't you talk about that first, the role of people in your images and what that means, and then, Jenny, I'd love to hear what you have to say, too. Yeah, great. Well, thanks again for, for having us, uh, Dale. This is a, um, a, a great opportunity to, to get to talk with you guys, and, and really, I think, a, a, a core and a, an important question. Um, yeah, so, so just to say a word on the role that photography plays, you know, when, when I teach um, courses and workshops for climate scientists, and I, and I train to be a, a climate science uh, uh, individual policymaker and, and scientist. One of, one of the first things I always do is I ask by a show of hands, how many people have read the IPCC report, which is essentially the, you know, the, the Bible when it comes to climate change. It's about, it's about this thick and invariably these hands go up. And the, the first thing I do is I say, liars, liars, you've, you've not read this. People, people don't read this stuff. Even you guys who are the climate scientists, you read your piece because you wanna make sure everything's spelled right. But most of us just do not sit through that much data. And I think as humans, we fancy ourselves as very, you know, rational agents. We get the best possible data and we, you know, we base our attitudes and our decisions around that. But the research shows us again and again for, for most of us that we are very emotional creatures. We make decisions emotionally uh, and we're very normative um, animals as well. And I'll, and I'll say more about that later. And so, you know, I, th I think what part of the power and the promise of visual storytelling is that it, it can make that emotional connection to characters and to, to, you know, to go up to what you're saying about people in photos. One of the reasons why I, why I work with people, and it, it, part of it is I think humans are just the most fascinating animals on the planet. So I, I, they're, they're hard to work with. They're interesting to work with. Um, and, and so that's why I'm, 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 I'm drawn to stories about people, but also, you know, uh, when we look at the research about what drives, um, drives us to change, what, what change our attitudes, human focused stories tend to come at the top of the list. They're just very, very powerful stories. Not that you can't tell very compelling stories about the natural world, about landscapes as well. We, we also care about those things. Um, but, but, but humans that we can extend moral consideration to, we can see ourselves in, in them, that tends to be the most powerful thing. So that's another reason why, um, why I tend to do that. And then, I, and then I just wanted to say finally, and to um, kind of rip off what Dennis was saying is I, I think it is important that the photos or the film or whatever it is that you're making is really just the foot in the door. I mean, we, we, we can't assume that that can do all of the work. Um, as Dennis was pointing out, I mean, there's a lot of scientific nuance that's important for people to wrap their heads around if they do want to make good decisions and have informed conversations and the photos alone aren't going to give you that. So I think when photo editors or magazines or scientists think about this, they need to think about the images as the conversation starter. And then it's where do you go from there? And for me, I, and when I talk to photographers, I always advocate to them that making your images is just the beginning of your work. From there, you've got to connect with uh, media outlets, you've got to connect with educators, you've got to connect with policy folks. Um, so it's about building that network and that's how you drive change, right? So we have to strengthen those networks if we want you know, good looking photos to do great work in service of this issue. Good point. It's a very good point, uh, Jenny. It's interesting. I, I, you know, I always look for for people in photographs. I always look for the stories through people's eyes. And I was going through some of your work again today, and it took me a little bit to realize there weren't people, but I was still feeling that that human connection. Can you talk about that and and why you chose that and why that's important for you for this kind of work that you're doing? Yeah, and you know, my background is in architecture. I went to school for that, so that's a primary reason and of my focus in my photographic work. I think I've always been drawn to figuring out symbols in landscapes that allude to these larger systems that we operate under. And I've spent the better part of the past decade in Louisiana, a state that, as most people are aware, is experiencing the impacts of climate change at a very rapid rate with 
coastal erosion and sea level rise. So for me, you know, the role of photography is different for, for different areas, for different, you know, parts of media. Um, I work in an area that has historically been dominated visually by disaster images, by aerial images, by um, visuals that don't necessarily get to the crux of what life is like on a, on a daily basis and, and seeing this place for the beauty that it is. Um, so, you know, I think that, oh, I'm just trying to, I also am trying to share my screen right now too. I hope it works. Can you see it? I do. I see your, your folder there. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So a lot of my work focuses on architecture and infrastructure as a means of really, as, um, you know, as Michael was saying before, being able to kind of be the launching point for these conversations that people that aren't necessarily in the climate field, and even if they are not, um, you can't expect um, there to just be kind of one, um, one way of obtaining information that is emotional, that's informative, that's all of these things. So I'm trying to really kind of provide, and I'm interested in, um, developing a, another type of visual language to document, but also speculate on, you know, the future of these environments and looking at history of building practices, um, architecture, land use practices, those types of things that have really influenced how we live in these spaces. Um, again, South Louisiana is a place that also has historically been heavily exploited with the oil and gas industry. Um, so in the canon of American art, these areas have not been uh, represented at the same level as places like the Hudson River Valley or um, you know, the West in terms of photographic history and, and kind of talked about in the, the beautiful American landscape. So I'm with my work really interested in figuring out ways to celebrate and acknowledge the beauty that exists here. Um, what's currently still there and what may not be there in the future as a way of really thinking about um, what, what we may be losing. So, so Jenny, I want to I want to get back to you, uh, back to what Dennis was talking about uh, in the initial uh, initial opening remarks, and and uh, and and it is a challenge. It's that challenge of how do you how do you show change? How do you show this huge issue that's complex, that's difficult to visualize at times? Uh, what are the challenges that that you're facing in your work in capturing those images, uh, and what do you look for as you're trying to show this this huge shift in what's happening in the world? I think that when I first started, I had more pressure, whether that was self-imposed or not, to really try to create an image that summarized climate change in a single frame, and you know, the longer that I've been working in this field, I, the less I believe that that's possible or something that we should really even be striving to achieve. You know, um, a lot, most of my projects are long-term projects, commitments to a place that you see changes over time and the work accumulates and you see those, you know, significant or um, sometimes not so significant changes in landscape. But, you know, I think, a, a challenge is definitely figuring out ways to emphasize these, for me, the way that I work in the built environment and infrastructure and architecture, these um, oftentimes overlooked aspects of the lived experience that are so symbolic of how we organize space, how we inhabit land. Um, a lot of houses that I photograph are elevated. Those, you know, in context of, of a larger project of mine, when you look at the different ways of building styles in South Louisiana, what houses are slab on grade, which houses are elevated, um, how high they're elevated, who's within a, the flood protection system, who's not. Images of those, um, you know, built systems together really kind of talk about these 
the inequalities that exist, you know, the different types of flood insurance, all of these larger concepts that relate to, to relocation, to um, climate adaptation, to all of these things, rather than, you know, having it be something where it's it, the entry point into the story is through one person. I'm trying to kind of look at these larger systems and how they add up. So, um, you know, photographing a levee wall, a lot of people would see it as boring, but I try to do that in an interesting way. So that's, that's always a challenge, but I'm still working on it. I wonder if uh, some of that, and you're not the only photographer I've talked to who's had that, that issue, <laughs> excuse me, at some point in their work of how do I get that one photo to symbolize climate change, which is similar to, you know, a war photographer saying, I need that one photo that, that encapsulates war. I mean, things that are this expansive, this complex, it's difficult to find one image that's going to truly tell that story. Well, that's so, an unrealistic uh, expectation, don't you of think? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, but, but, you know, as photographers, I think that, that we still want to have that image that will galvanize and that will, that will bring enlightenment. And, and I think that's a, uh, you're right. It's, it, it is unreasonable, but uh, not unusual for people to feel that way. So, so Michael, I'm going to ask you the same question. And Dennis, I want to come back to you then to, to expand on this a bit. So, Michael, the same question. You, you've had at least three major projects looking at sea level rise. How do you go about trying to, uh, uh, to do, as Dennis talks about, find a way to, to show change, to show, uh, to, 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 I guess, symbolize these issues that are so complex and so so deep here. Yeah, well, first I wanna say, Ginny, your work's uh, beautiful. I really enjoyed taking a look there. I, I'll show you guys um, a little bit of, of some of the projects that, that I've been working on here. And I think I can draw up some highlights about some of the challenges that I've uh, faced doing this work um, and showing you some of the images. Is that on full screen now? It is. Uh, so, no, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, oh, they're on. They're on a timer. That's that's fine. We'll just we'll just time our way through these. Um, so these are all images from a project that I've been working on for about seven years now, called Eroding Edges. And um, it, the the goal with this project is really to look at impacted communities from four different communities around North America that are facing the impacts of uh, sea level rise and climate change, um, and and to look at those impacts, but then really to pivot to talk about um, courage and hope and solution and what's being done. And I and that's the first thing I wanted to highlight here is that a lot of the the media industry and and to a certain extent we're all complicit in this is really driven around disaster porn, as you as you pointed out. Um, it, it it sells and that says something about who we are as people, I, I suppose, and also the nature of, of media. Um, but we, we, we know two things. One is that it doesn't, it doesn't really compel people again to, to change. Um, a, a lot of times if you show a terrible issue and you don't show what can be done about it, you don't show that there's hope, you don't um, show that there's people that are working on this and making a difference, people tend to retreat from the issue rather than engage, right? You're gonna get the opposite effect. They sort of, there's a, a sticking your head in the sand um, effect that happens. And there's a name for that in, in research that I've, I've forgotten. But on the other hand, if you can show communities that are active, engaged and in doing something, most importantly, it gives those communities hope. And it's, it's a beacon to other communities that are on the front lines that yes, they can do something. And I, I really look at frontline communities as, as my primary audience, because I think we are locked into so many of these impacts um, that we're support towards them first is becoming quickly our, our most important thing. Um, and then of course, mitigating impacts as much as we possibly can. Um, but again, telling positive stories is, is a challenge. Um, another one, um, and, and sorry if these are going through a bit quickly here, but another one to, to highlight is um, doing this work long-term. Um, as Ginny was pointing out, um, I, I, I think there, there, there's, there's two reasons for me why, why I wanna do that focus. One is that the nature of climate change itself um, it's not a weekend story, right? This is something that happens over time. And so the only way to see that is to be in place for a long time. And the second is um, sort of honoring the people that are there that are, that are living this. I think it's very difficult for me to do this work the way I do it without taking the time to intimately get to know people, really know their eyes, know their stories, gain the trust and the access to show, to show them, uh, I, I think in a, in, a, in a rich human light, you know, that's the end of that. Um, 
that series there. So I'll, I'll back off. So, you know, finding trust, you know, I mean, certainly that's a big, big part of that is building trust, building understanding, building connections, but also finding the funding um, to be able to do long term journalism in, in, in these places um, is a challenge as well. And then the, the, the final thing I wanted to say, and this is more kind of a creative um, question um, that, that was highlighted before is that Climate change is, it's, it's got this weird thing where it's everywhere simultaneously and sea level rise is everywhere. It's, it's omnipresent in these communities, but it's also kind of invisible. You know, it's sort of like the water that we're always in and you don't really, you don't really see it happen, at least not on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So from a visual storytelling perspective, how do you make the invisible visible is um, I think just a, a constant uh, challenge. And I, I want to show you a little bit of work from um, my recent fellowship, I, I, I'm just wrapping this up um, with um, the Bertha Foundation. And so bring you back into share here. And the whole, the whole focus of this work um, was, was trying to do just that, was make the invisible visible. So I went at, after that in a, in a few different ways. Um, one was to map where um, the, uh, the coast is going to be in the Chesapeake Bay by about the year 2100. And then to move along that coming coastline, the name of this project is called it the coming coast and to show where that coastline is going to be. Um, so these photos are doing that. Then these, these second ones is I did drone photos and then I took the same thing in the year 2100, six feet of sea level rise. I sort of picked a number and that's what we're probably heading towards if we don't get a lot, a lot more serious between two and six feet. And um, then I painted in what that would look like at these four different places. These are all different locations along the Chesapeake Bay. And then finally, uh, let me see if I can get these to come up. I spoke with um, a number of individuals um, around the bay. Looking for a screen here. Um, and for each of them, I asked them to tell me what, what it's like now. Where do they see it going? What are they doing about this issue? And then I asked them to hold um, a depth stick to show what six feet of sea level rise would be like for their location. So again, like all these different ways to try to show that this is already a part of our story. The coming coast is already here, but it's going to be something that's going to be with us. And it's going to be in this spaces that are very difficult for us to imagine that it's, that it's going to be. Now, it's, we don't need to be prescriptive about this. We don't know the extent to which it's going to be in these spaces. We don't know what we're going to do about it. Um, and maybe there will be a, a technological black swan that will save us from some of these impacts. There's a lot of unknowns, but we still have to move forward with what we do know and hope that if we can take, you know, Take the actions that are in front of us now. We can we can move these uh, these tapes down lower in all of these communities. Um, so so again to, to kind of come back to the point, it's you know trying to find new and creative ways to to show this issue um, and to do it in a way that's engaging for audiences and hopefully gets them engaged in 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 the conversation. Powerful images. So so Dennis, let me come back to you. Let me first uh, remind those who are watching that that we would love your questions as well. Uh, you can send them in and uh, our, our host will help us uh, get those over to us and we can try and respond to some of your questions as well. Um, so Dennis, I, I, I wanted to, to have you go third here and come back to this because of, of your role. You spent many years uh, as a photographer and editor and writer at Geographic. And so you not only did work, but you trained others to do work and you had a vision that you wanted to have others realize and implement. So uh, my thought is that you probably have a lot of good ideas on how to teach people how to do this better that would be of value not only to journalists and photographers going to the field, but also to the researchers who are watching us now. What, what kind of message, what kind of uh, uh, instruction did you convey to people that you were working with when you were sending photographers out to to try and look at these issues? Well, I mean, I think uh, part of my answer can actually come from talking a bit about Jenny's work because it's what it is. There's an eloquence, eloquence and an elegance to that work that speaks to the nature of the built landscape and how it is threatened and changing. And the, the way she's presenting it I can imagine you just keep going back and going back. In years, you will be in a position to have images that, that show kind of like what I was trying to do with the ice. Years later, you then 
then you actually are prima facie showing the evidence of change. And that's and and in the same way that Michael was taking the images to um, using the overviews of the landscape and then 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 modifying the image to uh, present the projection of sea level rise on the human built landscape. That's a way to allow us to begin to envision what we're up against and see that I think, so as a practicing photojournalist, if you will, uh, this kind of photography for me is if I may get thrown out of the church, but it to me feels almost post photojournalism. It's, it's a type of documentary work that, that, that is defined by time and place. And it, the, the, the demands and, and the virtues of this work are almost outside the realm of journalism as, in, as defined by news. The, there are different time frames for, for what is compelling and what is interesting and what would what might make page one tomorrow is not the picture of the um, elevated house on bricks on, on, in, in, in coastal uh, Louisiana, but it becomes a testament to, to the sort of the evolution of our relationship to the land. I remember after um, uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2004, um, or was it 2005? One of the most compelling sets of photographs I ever saw from that, um, Robert Polidori went into the ninth ward of New Orleans and photographed, I think it was for the New Yorker or the New York Times Magazine, he photographed the remnant water line on the houses after the water had receded. And it's like those images, those images in an incredibly compelling way conjured our imaginations about what it must have been like, not only on the outsides of the house, but you could see the, you could see the water line on, on the walls inside the house. That kind, of, that kind of photography is to me the kind of sort of enduring imagery that we, we need to be trying to find when we're documenting this kind of change. So as I'm, I'm listening, I'm hearing a couple of things. And one is that, that this idea of change that you, you led with is, yeah. is critical in something that, that researchers can be thinking about. Many research projects might be over five years, over a period of years, and they can, they can document in that sense. So that's a, that's a way of, of showing their work and showing change through their work. Um, also, this uh, I, I'm, it, this is this is a question more for I guess photojournalists than it is for researchers. But you're talking about what some would describe as advocacy journalism, and that's kind of what we're talking about. It, through, is that not that a contradiction about. in terms? I'm just asking you. I, explain. Advocacy journalism. Mm -hmm. Then are you then you are advocating? What are you advocating for? Are you advocating for awareness? Are you advocating for illumination? Are you advocating for the planet? What is the role of the journalist? Is it not to be able to document and have evidence that you can back up? I mean, if you're an advocacy journalist, does that then mean you are then working for say a, uh, um, an NGO? No, I have, I mean, to me, this is a serious question because if you become a pro advocacy also speaks to propaganda and look, I'm all about, I'm all about the idea that, you know, we need to, to, we do need to, as, as human beings advocate for a livable future for ourselves and our children, right? You, you wouldn't, you're not going to be out there advocating for more, say, coal fired power plants, right? So this, I is, mean, this, this is a, something I've, I've, this is the way I've always responded to that question. And in my own mind is that 
sure, I'm advocating for clean air, clean water, clean land. <laughs> which of those don't you want? <laughs> which is which is right. the problem here? Yeah. So I okay, do understand. Okay, as long that. as we define the terms, okay. Uh, Jenny, Michael, do either of you run into this with with editors, though? I mean, I, I know that some journalists have encountered this, the, the, this view that by the very act of taking these images and showing this, that you're you're advocating for a position. And we'll get back to more of the research aspect of this, but I'm, I'm fascinated by this, too. And I, Dennis, I think your response is, is just spot on. But I'm curious about the, the two of you in dealing with editors and trying to sell your work, get your, your work seen. Do you run into this issue? Well, it is something that comes up a lot in conversations that I have um, because I work so closely um, with nonprofit organizations. I work with researchers. I work with advocates. I work with people in policy and I work with journalists defining these terms. I, I do think is really important, um, you know, and I think you can have a value set as a as a documentary photographer, as, as a journalist and still be doing journalism. But I do. It, I do think for me, it, it requires a few things. Well, one of them is having your cards on the table. So, you know, if you, you know, is, is laying out where, where you are. Another one is having a degree of autonomy. I think you're on, you're on the payroll for, you know, a nonprofit organization to make a certain project, so then you, you, need, you need to state that, you know? And I think, um, so I, I, I think there are areas where it does, it does get a little, a little bit sticky. But I, I also think that, you know, it's, it moves into a bit of a, an absurd space when we're, we, we talk about um, journalism as something that needs to be purely objective, as though we paint all possible truths up and you get to pick out which one it is. Well, not, not all possible truths are, are, are equally as good, ultimately. They're not equally as defensible. So taking a position, I think, also needs to be okay. So in, in all of that, there's going to be a gray space and calling what is activism and what is journalism is it I think is an interesting is an interesting question and for, for me I just tend to anyone that says that they know what the answer is and here it is I I, I tend to move away from that and I want to challenge that because I, th I think it's a it's a thing to be explored um, rather than um, something that has a has a discrete um, answer to it well especially since uh, it's it's particularly used to minimize work to reduce its reduce its effect Jenny have you run into this at all it's a little bit different for me because my, you know, primarily my background has been more on the fine art end and not with a capital F A fine art, but, you know, in terms of more gallery work or um, uh, commissioned work rather than editorial. So for the past two years, I would say, I just started really working more with um, publications that are running stories around climate change in Louisiana, but it's it comes from a place where I'm fortunate enough to be able to kind of choose what sorts of projects I take on in that way. And they're aligned with kind of the, the work that I've already been building. So there's already an understanding of kind of how I want the work to be communicated and what stories are, are being told that, you know, the imagery that I have been producing and kind of my perspective would, would help highlight there, so yeah. Okay, we're getting, I'm sorry, sorry yeah. let's go ahead. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, if one were to be an advocate for anything, and this actually speaks more broadly than just as, for photography, it I, I see this all the time in environmental journalism, is that what we are advocates for is transparency. We're advocates for helping people understand what is happening in society. And that, I mean, in some ways, those were some of the underlying rationales, you know, when when I'm working with photographers or we're doing a project in 2014, we did a big series on the future of food. And we looked at the industrialized food landscape and one, uh, right off the bat, one of our photographers was, was arrested and jailed for trespass in Western Kansas because he dared take aerial pictures of a cattle feedlot. And so the question there becomes, and what are they trying to hide? And, and, and the same thing goes for energy infrastructure, you see, and that we did a big piece and I have, I can show you six or seven pictures from that if you don't mind, dealing with coal, the role of coal in the world energy landscape, you see, and that becomes, that becomes the, the, the bigger question is, it's like, but people don't know what this looks like. And so what we used the, as the ostensible question was, can it ever be clean? Well, no, not really, 
unless you completely understand the incredible magnitude of carbon capture and sequestration, which is would end up needing to be as big or bigger than the existing oil pipeline system. Here, for example, one of the world's largest carbon emitting power plants uh, near Atlanta, which, which requires this much coal per week to keep going. This is from Chesapeake. This is work by Rob Kendrick. We worked on this project for probably three years. Here, a, a multi-image pano of the Hobart 21 mine in West Virginia. He couldn't get anybody to fly him locally. Nobody wanted him up there. Everybody was in somebody's pocket. Luckily, somebody from Chesapeake Energy who was flying along pipeline said, your money's as good as anybody else's. But this is what is being done to produce kilowatts. Or here, this is in Wyoming, the arm on that, that this is off, you know, BLM land. Look at, uh, as John McPhee said in one of his books, that the, the coal trains across the United States are the world's largest conveyor belt. And this is taking low sulfur coal from the West in Wyoming and keeping the lights on in the East. I the love arm, the scale with that, with the train in the background. The scale, the yeah. arm on that, that, that steam shovel is 400 feet long. Or here oh. in China, he got, kept getting thrown out. You know, he'd have to go into this place and he was there for about like three minutes and then he had to leave or was thrown out or was arrested. These people sorting rocks. Here in India, for example, he actually, people welcomed him in. He went into this sort of illegal underground coal mine that looks like something, you know, out of um, uh, Dante's Inferno, right? But this is trying to show people what it takes to get this black rock out of the ground that we light on fire as our essentially continuing dominant energy policy. And so part of it, a big part of that in answering the question to you about, about, you know, what would I say to photographers? It's like, we're trying to show stuff that people don't otherwise see. That's the role that we can do to help explain to people these, all these behind the wall things, whether it's in you know, how, how energy is produced, how food is produced, the way, American way of death. There are so many things in our culture that the, those who are the so-called experts don't, don't want to show us. All right, so we're getting questions in from the audience now, and I appreciate that. And just a reminder that please send your questions in. I believe it's in the, the, the chat box or the Q&A box that you have available, and they'll get those to us. And this one sort of fits in with what we're talking about here. So, how do you expand the reach of your photos? I suppose an intention of your photos is to make people stop, think, and perhaps change their behavior. How do we make sure this messaging gets to an expansive audience? Dennis, you want to lead with that? Uh, well, the, you know, part of the part of the part of the issue that you're facing right now is that the publishing industry, if you're using, if for example, if you are using the publishing industry as a vehicle to get to get your work out, I would say that it's uh, that you you be careful about expecting that the old line publishing houses are going to get your work out. And, and I think as, as individuals, as creators, as authors, and it's not just related to photographers. It's like, what, if you want to get your work out, what are you doing to make sure your work is available or at least examples of it? So that if I type your name into some, some search engine, I, I find your work. What are you use? What uh, what uh, what are you doing to uh, uh, make yourself pr present on social media platforms? You can argue the 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 social worth of those or not, but uh, a, a lot um, editors do look at platforms like Instagram. Uh, there was a fellow who uh, who who um, I remember some years ago. Uh, was photographing different cuts of beef, and he and he um, put those on his Instagram feed. He got an assignment from the Geographic to document the beef industry. So there are ways. Part of this is not just getting your work out; it's also 
letting the world know that you are out there and you are creating. Uh, you are thinking about the world that we live in and you're trying to express your ideas through your photographs and then you have them out there. And then if, you know, if people, if they, if people notice them and they affect people, people will pay attention. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to also echo that as someone who's been fortunate enough to connect with many people on Twitter or Instagram and opportunities come up that way. So a lot of it is self-promotion and, you know, really pushing your stuff out there, which can, you know, not be the most comfortable thing, but it is something that I think, you know, yields a lot of opportunities if you're consistent with it and um, really kind of targeted in terms of who you're following, what, who you engage with, you know, I, like I said, don't have primarily an editorial background in photography. It's It's been more independent work, but being able to connect with people who are directly in line with the climate space, with um, you know think tanks and organizations that are doing that kind of policy work, they start to know about you. And you know when opportunities for anything creative come up, like you're, you're at top of their mind. So something for someone like me that was just getting started several years ago, social media has been the, the best tool for that. Michael, any thoughts? Yeah, so if, if the question's about expanding audience and impact, both for photographers as well as for scientists and organizations that want to connect to, to this work, I've got a, a, a few thoughts. The first is actually thinking beyond photography. Um, one of the things that I often talk about is producing an ecosystem of, of media, right? We can, we can make still images, but nowadays one of the things that's so exciting and so cool is you know, we have so many tools at our discretion that used to cost maybe $100,000 to own all of these things. And now your, your iPhone can do it, or you can set up a, a pretty decent studio for $10,000 maybe and be able to produce things like uh, documentary films, a, an informational series, 360 degree video, still images, a written story, a podcast. You can mix that in with public presentations and public installations of work. You can go out to galleries. And so uh, a lot of times I advocate, let's, let, let's take one story and find a way to tell it with a lot of different tools. And the reason why that's powerful is you reach different audiences. Um, you can tell stories in different ways. All those different mediums have a different way of storytelling. And they can all echo back to each other. So it's like creating a system of, of nodes that all, all feed back. Um, so for all the projects I do, I, I try to do that at, at all times. If I can turn all of those keys, um, I, I try to do that. And if I can't turn those keys, I try to partner with people that, that can. Um, so, so that's the first thing. Um, secondarily, I'll say, yeah, the, you know, the landscape is changing in terms of how, how you get your stories out there. There are great op open platforms that you can publish on. In addition to Instagram, there's places like Lens Culture, Social Documentary Network is a, is a really good one. So there's other places you can put out there that don't have gatekeepers. You know, it's not like an editor is saying, you know, no to this story. You, you, you can just put it out there. Um, Photo shows and competitions are, are a really good space too to get seen. Um, but, and also, and this is a, Dale, actually, I, I just wrote you earlier today. Um, I've just had a, an image shortlisted for the uh, Welcome Prize. And, but the, then Welcome as an organization can go to the Guardian and they can put the work out there, right? So they have that caveat and that ability to run right through all those gates that may be hard for us as, as content creators to get through and they can get it published. So it's sort of just like a sidestep um, to get it out there. Um, and, and then of course, if you can partner with um, nonprofit organizations and share the images with them. I've used those connections to help those get into shows at, at the UN, for example. I'm hoping to show work at the climate conference this fall. And all of those connections are leveraged with researchers that I work with, advocates that I work with, um, educators that I work with. So again, I know I'm coming back to this, but if you can expand that network, then you have all the more opportunities to be able to find uh, creative avenues to, to get it out there and get it seen by different audiences and hopefully in different ways. I love that. And I want to get back to your comment about ecosystem of work, because some stories don't lend themselves to certain types of storytelling. This one might not be a photographic story. It might be better suited by, by a video. So thinking about your work and what medium best represents that work, I think, is important to do, too. Um, so and I also I want to bring this back to the to the academic setting, the research setting, too. So uh, I would say if you're a university based researcher, <clears throat> excuse me, certainly you want to talk to your to your uh, 
uh, your communications team. At Columbia, we have started a series of workshops. We're bringing photographers in to talk to researchers, to give them basic training in how to take a photo, basic training in, in what makes a good photo. So uh, research is responding well to that. Uh, and universities have ways of getting things out now. At Earth Institute, we have State of the Planet, which is a blog that uh, is updated on a daily basis with a lot of great information and reaches a lot of people. So one of the vehicles as well. As a researcher, you, you don't have to go at this alone, I guess what I'm trying to say, that there are uh, uh, university people who can help with this if you're university-based and uh, you want to tap into all of that. Also, something we talked about offline just before we got going is... Uh, uh, places like the National uh, Science Foundation, <clears throat> some of the uh, in, in, some of the people there who are offering grants now, some of the program officers are asking researchers to alter their communications components of their grant proposal. And what they're looking for is rather than the traditional communication mechanisms of going to nature or science that you put money aside in which you might bring a freelance journalist who covers your work. Uh, and that's part of the communications uh, uh, effort. Or a photojournalist who also comes in and documents with uh, photos and with video. Um, so there are, are, are new ways, new avenues, if you're willing to, uh, to take advantage of them. There are new ways and avenues to use some of the people around you to help you get this information out there further. Um, another question, uh, Jenny, do you have something to say there? I actually did yeah, just yeah. want to add something because yeah, something please. that you said about um, opportunities to connect pho photojournalists or creatives on, you know, in research or other other um, uh, projects of that nature. It, it made me think about a, you know, something that I personally have felt has been lacking in terms of kind of how these a lot of climate stories are told is that it's not necessarily prioritized having the story come from someone who's like from that area, you know, has a significant relationship, historical relationship to that place. And, and I'm aware of that in my own work in Louisiana. And it's something that I am cognizant of in how I work and that the perspective and stories that I'm telling are completely different from someone who has lived in that region for generations and, you know, what their observations are and what they have to say. So, um, I'm interested in, in ways that pub publications and outlets and, and organizations that are working on these stories are, you know, really making an effort to bring in those voices and really be intentional around, you know, who has those opportunities to really engage in not just the visual component, but other creative components as well. Uh, There's an interesting one thing. Oh, please, that's sure. Yeah, so the question, I think... T trying to break out of the, the normative, sort of like the researcher does the research, the journalist does the v implementation of the visual components of the research. I think there's also another way to think about this in that what if in fact the visual communication becomes the primary vehicle to express the research itself. For example, mm -hmm. James Baylog, the photographer, now he's a geologist by degree from CU Boulder. And the Extreme Ice Survey, which was a sequel to what I was showing you, was, was essentially a project that put 28 time-lapse solar-powered cameras at 28 different glacier locations around the, the, the Northern Hemisphere that then documented, uh, one uh, took a picture one hour for every hour of daylight for a year. Those projects, have those cameras have been in place now for over a decade. You take the images and you take them and put them into a movie editing program. You create a time-lapse record of what is happening to the ice on the earth. When he showed that initial work to geologists to scientists who were studying glaciers he said well is this what you is this like what you expect he said what do you mean i have never seen anything like this before so it is in fact possible that the visual communications can be the basic original research your output that's that's pretty powerful um yeah, yeah can i jump in here too before Please. we move on because i think i think you've actually highlighted a, a really critical question that I get from scientists all the time. They always say, okay, I'm, I'm bought in. Media is a really good thing. It helps me do what I want to do, but how do I, I don't know anybody in, in media. How do I find a photographer? How do I find a, a filmmaker? And so I just want to give some like quick practical advice for that, for that audience and highlight a few um, resources that, that they can use. But, but first I want to say to piggyback off, off what 
uh, uh, Dennis was saying, and I think Ginny may have said as well, is that finding a photographer that is, um, or a filmmaker, whoever, or a writer, whoever your media person is, that has uh, got access to that place and to that issue brings a lot of value. Um, and so they, whether they're from there and they have the, then they have the access to the community, they can go in and build on those networks. Or if they know that issue intimately, they've got a leg up on telling that story. It's not the only way to tell a story. You can bring in somebody from the outside that can do a great job, but you gain a lot by having that. So the, the, the first two resources here I wanna share are photographers that are principally trained in environmental issues. Okay. Uh, and so they're both really great resources. One is the Blue Earth Alliance where I'm a, a, a member and that's a, a, a collection of photographers and filmmakers all doing environmental issues. And the other is ILCP, the um, International League of Conservation uh, uh, Photographers. And those are both really great places to go. There's some huge names in there. There's also people that are um, uh, not as well known but are doing, doing excellent work. Another way to find great photographers, filmmakers, content creators is just go to your favorite outlet. Go to Nat Geo, New York Times, Post, Guardian, and just look and see who wrote the piece or who the photographer is, find their contacts and, and, and write them. I mean, we're, we, are, we tend to get pretty excited when we get an email, right? It's like, uh, we're, we're, we're waiting for those contacts to, to come in. So if you find somebody's work that you like, reach out. You might be surprised that they would be very, very willing to hear more about what you're doing and see, see if there's a story there. Um, and then last, I wanna say that following hashtags on Instagram can, can be quite a good way to do things. If you've got an issue that's your issue, that you're researching. So like sea level rise, hashtag sea level rise. Go there, find an image that you like and find a story tell you like you can connect that way. And then finally, these photo contests. Um, and if you don't know about photo contests, you could uh, look them up. Uh, photo Contest Insider is, is quite a good place to go and just see a list and then find your issue, um, whether that is health or whether that is climate change or, wh or, or whatever it is you're working on. And then you can find the winners and, and connect with them. So, uh, but I, the, the, the reason I wanna share all that is that that seems to be a major barrier that I hear over and over again for people is how do I find these folks that, that can do this work? So hopefully that helps fill in some, some gaps. Oh, that's fantastic. I want to get back to a point that Ginny was making too about uh, it's not cultural appropriation. There's another phrase for uh, coming in, taking, taking work out from a community, from a local community. And, and there was a project funded by the Moore Foundation. Extraction. Uh, yeah, uh, but there was a, there was a there was a uh, uh, knowledge extraction. There was a a a, uh, uh, a pr program funded by the Moore Foundation that its outcome really wasn't any real sort of outcome in the sense of uh, the traditional sense, but it was more having conversations in the community. So it was a, I think it was called Ice Bridges, but it was it was research into uh, uh, changing sea ice up in the uh, Arctic but in an uh, Alaskan community where they were working with indigenous researchers, uh, rather than, than just coming in, the outsiders coming in, taking that work away, but, but having more of a place-based focus on it and community-based focus. And so that there's a follow-up to that project as well. But it's interesting that at least one foundation is now looking at that and, and hopefully others will, will think more in that direction as well. So we've got a couple more questions I wanna to get to real quick. Uh, one is, um, uh, ties into this a bit, uh, uh, probably a quick answer here, but in, in my work, we purchase photos from Getty to supplement government resources to inform people about flood risk and adaptation. However, it's often hard to find the right photos. How hard is it for photographers to partner with institutions on publications, which is in a sense what we're talking about. And, and uh, I don't know who of you, which of you have done that, but if you want to respond to that. Uh, there's an, there's an organization that I've helped teach, uh, seminars on it's called climate outreach it's a british ngo and they have a subset called climate visuals and they have they actually have online a, a library of images that relate to things like climate threats climate adaptation uh climate solutions and they have partnered with they have they have partnered with um photo agencies I think like Getty and perhaps even Magnum to create sets of images that are that are essentially um, um, they have been vetted for their scientific integrity and accuracy, and that that would be a a, a a good resource. And what's it called again? Climate outreach. Ah, I was just going to bring them up actually because uh, I love the video that they did. Right. Uh, in which you have a cameo. 
uh, about the 10, 10 uh, features of, of good photography. Right, and, and they featured, a, uh, one of the feature pictures was a picture of a scientist at the top of a mountain in the Alps doing population studies on flowers in alpine environments. And that was actually an image that had originated with Peter Essek for one of our projects. So I think it's a, it's a, it's what it is, is it's a, it's a resource that, that is based in science and understanding. They actually also for the last IPCC, IPCC report was involved in uh, aggregating and, and organizing images that then were used as part of that report. So there was a collaboration with the scientific community. I was uh, excited to have Peter as one of my uh, fellows a few years ago in my Resilience Fellowship Program. It does a lot of good work. So a quick comment coming in from, uh, from uh, uh, one of our participants here. Uh, another opportunity for researchers is to use photo voice, a participatory action research method that asks participants to take photos of their own photos of their connection to place, observations of change, lived experience of risk, et cetera, which goes back to some of what you're talking about, Ginny, about community engagement, community involvement. And uh, again, it's that human element. So any, any thoughts or comments on that? I mean, I think, you know, something that, um, I think that that is inherently good. I think that there's a lot <laughs> to be done in the art world in terms of gatekeeping and, you know, opportunities for people rather than, um, how do I want to say this in a way that's diplomatic? I think that there's a lot of work to be done, especially in New Orleans and in Louisiana, a place that has had a significant amount of helicopter type journalism come in. Um, where people's stories are used, um, of course, to tell stories that are important, but it, it's it's something that ends up being extractive, like Michael was saying before. Um, so I think that you know there's a program with the Water Collaborative, the organization um, that I sit on the board of, where we're developing um, an artist collective that of New Orleans-based artists. Um, local artists to expose them to these environmental issues um, in terms of like providing grant opportunities and just kind of funneling opportunities to be in um, photo contests, things of that nature to really like expose and be able to kind of provide um, ways to engage more rather than having it be something where people are constantly kind of having to look for it themselves. So I think it's a balance of being able to you know, something like photo voice, but also for people like myself who have benefited immensely from um, having connections in the art world to really figure out ways to make that easier for people who don't have as many opportunities to engage. Uh, having worked in public radio for many years, there's a, a, a lot of opportunities of that sort of thing. Uh, uh, Joe Richman in New York with Radio Diaries, where people record themselves and they create a story out of their own life experiences. I know that in New York, there's an organization that takes in used cameras and teaches kids uh, photography so they can document their own world. So uh, what role does that play and how does that become a part of research that scientists might be doing too is, is an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, yeah, giving cameras to the kids and the people in the community seems like an underexplored idea. And while we are talking about rising seas, remember, as water goes up, water goes down. And we're seeing a whole emergent climate water, water going down crisis in the southwest and the west. And it's almost like there's a whole other complete subject matter area as it relates to the impacts of climate change out there. So another question coming in, I work in the area of cultural heritage and climate change. I'm often asked for good photos, which are often a struggle to find. So I'm wondering if the panelists were asked to capture heritage and climate, what would they look for? Tougher, more well, direct uh, question. Yeah, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm going to answer that. But can I just give one more thing on our on our final oh, question, sure. mm -hmm. too, as well about this notion of ex extractive media and sort of al alternatives to that? Because um, I think it's a really important ethical question um, in this in this line of work. And it's particularly important to me. I, 
I grew up in, in Appalachia and there's a long history there of extractive everything, you know, quite literally the economies there were extractive, but media today in those places extracted. Folks come in, they take a story out, the money goes with them, the story goes with them and nothing comes back. And it's in going to affected communities by sea level rise over the past seven years, that that's the norm. I mean, people, I mean, really people do helicopter in, fly in, they get what they need and, and, and they get out and, and little comes back. And so the, I don't think there's a clean fix to that, but I just want to, um, you know, for the photographers um, listening in, want to just give, plant some ideas about other ways that you can do that work. Um, so one thing you can definitely do is focus is, as much as you possibly can, hear their stories, focus on their voices and elevate their voices rather than your own and work with your editor to say, I want to make sure that their voices are being heard here. Not, not the story that we think, not prescriptively our story, but their story is in there. And sometimes you got to push to make that happen. Um, I, I always try to find a grant to bring the work back to the community and show the work in the community so people can see themselves, feel ownership over it. So I gallery it in the community that was made as much as, as, much as possible. Um, sometimes try to pay to bring the speakers that is, folks that are uh, fo uh, focused on in the stories to conferences and things so they get to be involved in, in the storytelling. Um, and then licensing images back to nonprofits that are doing the work. A lot of times I'll write a, a free license to um, organizations that are working on these issues in the community so they can use that to drive their own, own change board. So, and, and then of course that idea of, of, of um, finding grants to get cameras for people in the communities. So lots of solutions to counter that and hopefully support these frontline communities. Yeah, there was a great um, phrase for this. It was, it was journalists as anthropologists. We'll go in and look with mm -hmm. the, and see what the natives do, then we'll go back and report rather than actually knowing what's going on. It's been a criticism, it's, you know, the flyover country. It's been a criticism of much national journalism for, for many, many years. So this, Jenny, goes back to what you're talking about as well. So it just, it's just, it's how do we, how do we reverse that? How do we reduce that? How do we get uh, more voices on the ground who actually know what's going on? So I'm sorry, Michael, go ahead. Well, no, that, that was just going to answer the second part of the question. I, I would think about it, if somebody came to me with an idea for a project, I would think about it in, in two pathways. Option one is I want to find some really great, really compelling characters that are doing something about this issue. I want to know what they're doing. I want to know about agency. I want to know about action. And then I want to follow them as, as they do these things. I want to see the inside of their world. And that's more the kind of, you know, reportage, you know, uh, photojournalism kind of character driven narrative narrative driven angle. I, I think that's one route that tends to be the one that I'm a little more comfortable with. But there's a lot of great people. And I, I think, you know, looking at Ginny's work, it seems that she's she's taken this focus. And that, and that is how do we show this issue in a totally, totally different right, a, a light, a, a new way of looking at it. And sometimes that's by implication. And I want to um, highlight a good friend of mine, uh, Johnny Miller's work. He's done unequal scenes. I actually think Nat Geo has covered this time. It was on the cover of Time magazine as well. And Johnny uh, was an early adopter of drones to look at inequality from above. But it, it's just a classic example of how you can take a, a different approach, say in Ginny's case, an architectural approach to tell a sea level rise issue. So that would be the other way that I would think about it. How can we creatively get after this with some sort of novel tool or technique to make the invisible visible? So that those would be the two pathways that I would explore to answer that question. Okay, and and uh, someone had asked what the second group you had mentioned the, the the Blue Earth Alliance along with ILCP. So make sure that that anybody who missed that uh, has both of those groups. So we've got. Uh, Did oh, we answer oh, the cultural heritage question? Oh, you're right. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Let's go back to the cultural heritage. So uh, 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 if you're asked to capture cultural heritage and climate, how would you go about that? So Dennis, you have an answer to that cultural heritage and climate, I guess, first off, the, the question is, what, what are the visible visual iconography or representations that uh, exist of the culture that you're trying to document? Part of the problem that we're facing is in depending upon the environment that you're in, some of those records just don't exist. If you look, for example, if you're trying to find old, say, archaeological evidence of, say, uh, cultures and civilizations in the Pacific Northwest, you're going to be hard pressed because of the moisture and the degradation. So it's very difficult to find those. Mm -hmm. It's much different than if you wanted to then go to the Southwest and find that, you know, the the uh, uh, drought abandoned uh, uh, settlements and, and things. So it's, I guess it all depends upon the situation that you are in 
first and also what is it that you were trying to say about the people and like was it was it drought was it rising seas was it famine was it you know had they was it pestilence all of these questions and then figure out what the research question is and then figure out what evidence there is existing and then figure out what you can document that exists already and then some of that then uh, a colleague of mine Jim Richardson has done a lot of work in in uh, the in Scotland, for example, with old civilizations, and then you have to you have to go into the remnants of the cultures, and then and and it's more than just taking pictures. It's usually then trying to orchestrate situations with light and time of day and things like drones to actually provide a fresh perspective. Hmm. Michael, Jenny, any other things to add? Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a great answer. It's a great answer, Dennis. Thank you. So we, we've we've got uh, 20 minutes left. Uh, we should have a couple more questions coming in from the audience, but we've we've talked a lot about what photographs can do and what they can show. But Dennis, what don't photos do well? Uh, well, see that I think is perhaps to understand what are the potentials and also the limits of photography is going to allow you, say, as a researcher and as a journalist, to not overburden uh, photographs to do something they're incapable of doing. For example, by my mind, that photography is very good at describing. And you can, you can by like what I've been showing earlier, you can show uh, changes uh, over time. But, but it's difficult for photographs to actually explain why, for example. You can, I mean, you can, you can, like I think about uh, W. Eugene Smith's Country Doctor essay, and it's, it's famous, it was in Life magazine, and it helps you understand um, what is going on as the doctor goes through his rounds in, in the rural, rural countryside, but it, you, you need the words to explain why that is happening, or you need the words to provide context. And so I, I guess the, the thing that I would say, if you're trying to use photographs uh, in, in, to communicate environmental issues, uh, figure out what photographs are good at and what they're not good at. And then what are other types of media uh, that, that, will help provide necessary context that the photographs cannot. I would say that photographs now that where there's an increased role of say aerial fo photographs or even satellite images when used in sequences or things are going to provide a context where just on the ground images uh, could not. But when you're thinking about communicating these issues, think about the role of where, 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 do, where can photographs work? As Michael has said, they may just be the gateway into the bigger, deeper conversation. They're the way that allows you to sort of engage the, the, the heart and the imagination to bring people into an issue. And then, then other kinds of media, words, yes, charts, uh, animations, data viz, maps, all these kinds of things are necessary other aspects that will that will provide the kinds of context that pictures alone cannot. Michael, what don't they do well? Well, I think Dennis hit it on the head there. Um, you know, they can they can show us something maybe we didn't we didn't yet know about the world, but that but that's kind of the end of it. You know, I, I maybe they can move us in in some way as a consequence of seeing that they can create some sort of spark inside of us that'll allow us to take that next step. But it's about providing that next step that, that seems to be really important. And, and hopefully if someone clicks on a link to, you know, they see the photo and the photo pulls them in, they click on the link, they do read the article. Um, the, the research is not very hopeful about how much time people spend into reading articles these days, um, as folks in media know, um, that there's a certain subset of the population that does dig through and does follow up. But um, but for you know, but but more often than not, unfortunately, that isn't the case. I, I I think for me, when I think about building community engagement around my work, and to me, that's a really important part of my work. As I mentioned before, when I when I try to build um, 
engagement events, we'll just say. You know, I, I, I certainly speak at those and I can speak to the photographing. I can speak to the nature of documentation and how to do documentation well. But I, but I can't speak to what it's like to be living with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, some of the issues I work on, I do, but sea level rise, I, I don't, I'm, I, I live pretty far inland. And so I always wanna bring somebody from the impacted community that can speak to that. Um, even though I trained to be a climate scientist, I'm 20 years almost out of that now. So I oftentimes bring somebody that can speak from a science perspective. Um, I bring somebody that can speak from a, a um, political perspective, usually a local leader that's, that's um, uh, designing changes that they can do. I try to bring somebody from the business community that's looking at how we can look at leadership um, there as well. So I, I think by build, putting those voices together in a room, and that room could be virtual, it could be a, a Zoom talk, it could be um, a, 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 another space online. I, I think it's, it's those spaces that allow people to pick out which voice is most relevant for them and hopefully you know, pick up the information that they need to, to be able to take take the next steps. But it, it seems to me, again, critical that we make those linkages. Um, and I think different photographers feel differently about whose responsibility it, it is to do that. Um, I certainly take it on myself to, to, to do that, but sometimes they look at um, their media partners as the ones that, that should be doing that. And perhaps that's a role that media partners can can get better at. I think the question there, coming back to Dennis's question, is at what point in time do you wade into advocacy by by doing that? And and you've got to be careful about that. But but anyway, that there is a real opportunity there, um, and I have seen places like uh, Nat Geo and others take take that step into making sure that we're making the connections to policy and to science um, and to frontline communities. I want to push back. Uh, you had a lot of good things. I want to push back on one thing and the idea of of uh, people not paying attention to longer form stuff. Um, I would argue that they're more the subset. When you look at uh, a lot of the media outlets, Atlantic Monthly, long stuff, they get tens of millions of hits on, on their website a month. Uh, National Public Radio, which in broadcast is considered the long form of, uh, of journalism, has 14, 15 million listeners uh, on a daily basis to their, uh, their flagship news programs, they have millions of hits a day on their website. I, I, I would argue that the public is not uh, necessarily distracted by long form, but they're discerning. And I think that what a lot of journalists, especially when it comes to environmental news, uh, they don't look at the quality of what they put out. People are discerning, they don't want crap. They want stuff that's that's contextualized. We haven't talked about context, by the way, but that in the terms of journalism, that's the connecting tissue around it that helps you make greater sense of the story. And uh, good contextualized stories that are told in a very storytelling fashion that engages people, they find an audience and they find often find a broad audience. So we forget that, I think, at times. And we get frustrated when you see that, that the average length of time for someone looking at a video online is seven seconds. But when you look at a lot of the videos that are online, they're only worth five seconds. So they're actually getting a little more than they should have. So I, I just want to push back so that we're not so discouraged in thinking that people aren't going to pay attention to our work if we do this longer form work. It's finding that audience that is going to pay attention to it. Uh, so one anyway. Ex yeah. One example of that uh, was it 2017? Catherine Schultz wrote a piece in the New Yorker called "The Big One," and it was all about the next Cascadia earthquake that was going to hit the Pacific Northwest. You can't stop reading that piece, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. And it's all about its environmental journalism par excellence because it it brought in the historical aspects of the last big quake in 1700 which was recorded in Japanese monasteries from because of tidal waves. And th by using what happened in the past as a guide to what's heading to the Northwest real soon now. I'm, I'm, I'm adding to my uh, reading list through this, oh my uh, through this program. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, Jenny, is there anything you wanted to add to this? Didn't um, exclude you there. No, I definitely agree with what was previously said. I also, you know, working in a state that whose politics are not necessarily in alignment with what needs to be done to save um, the coast. Certainly there's a $50 billion master plan underway to restore and preserve certain parts of the Louisiana coastline, but it's by no means as aggressive as it, as it should be. And not that that's just a state problem, but um, you know, I think that photographs, what they can't do is convince people 
as much as as passionate as you are about the the subject matter and what you hope for the work to do um and it's not an end all like you know has previously been said by by michael in terms of being able to utilize images and partner with other organizations or or ways to really expand the work and and enrich in it so um that's definitely something that i have experienced with my own work the limitations of that and just being persistent in terms of um you know really trying to get those stories out there and and reach as many people as possible so i want to throw something out i, I think we need to go to uh if we can i've got another quick question from folks and then maybe if there's time to talk about some best practices for photos but i want to throw something out very quickly because we've talked uh, and sort of tiptoed around the 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 idea of an emotional connection to your stories as a way to get people connected. I worked with a, a trainer for years. He was from the CBC up in Canada, and he had a, a saying that I loved, not for the way he used it, but uh, uh, he would say that God gave us eyelids, but didn't give us earlids, which gave audio this particular power to get inside you and grab you in the gut. And when you grab people emotionally, that then opens up their heads to be able to take in more information. You know, there's an old saying, numbers numb. And if we do stories just based on numbers, it, it people tend to zone. That's their seven second, second video because people are just going to zone out. But if we find an emotional connection, it doesn't have to be audio. It can be the images. It can be video. It can be whatever tools we're using. But, but if there's an emotional connection that gives people a reason to care, Dennis, you were talking about uh, 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 climate outreach and their work, and that they talked about this, that so often when we talk about climate change, the images of that same old polar bear out there on that little ice flow floating off in the distance. And people can't connect with that. They can connect with what we've been talking about, those people on the ground, the people who were affected, those people holding that stake with that blue line. Those are ways that people become connected to a story and become more willing to take in information. So let me ask this last question, then if, if we have time for a couple of best practice, real quick, you know, like a lightning round of best practices. So this question is the sea level rise uh, type area may be the many South Pacific islands that are consistently inundated, for example, uh, Tuvalu. The stories, uh, while dramatic, seem to be one-offs. We then get to the next story. How do you keep the topic alive? We've touched on that a little bit, but that if we could, if you've got 30 seconds about how to keep, keep pressure on this. I opened up talking about the, the env modern environmental movement and those change, changes that occurred because of those dramatic stories. But it was the drumbeat of those stories that really got people angry and pushed Congress to affect change. So I think that's what they're getting at. How do you keep the topic alive? So a quick 30 seconds from each of you, if you could. Dennis? Uh, so think about the next phase of the story itself. So if you're talking about uh, environmental conditions making life in a particular area uninhabitable uh, or more difficult than it was, then the question is, where do they go? Who is going to take them in? What the whole question of climate migration? We we talk about building taller walls, but we aren't talking about as much about uh, well, what's causing people to want to move or need to move? And if there were more, uh, to me, if there was more more uh, 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 study and reporting that's helping people understand that that other other people just like us are no longer able to live in the places that they are. That is a, and where are they going and what is happening to those people? That's a good way to keep the story going. That's, that's a great promotion for this conference. Thanks, Dennis. Michael, how about no you? Problem. Yeah, I, I think the answer to the question depends on the audience that you're trying to reach. And we have an inside the choir audience that's already engaged and they know about environmental issues and they they probably, they're the ones you're talking about that, that do read these long form stories. So if it's that audience, then it's about connecting them to the tools for next steps. How do we get involved with this action, whether it's a, uh, a, a piece of policy they can you know support or defend? How do they get involved in their community? Here's some things you could be doing in your workplace or whatever. But it's about putting them in position to make the next steps to do something in the, in the, in their lives with what they know and what they believe in. So it's activating them. And I would say that's probably the more important of the two if you're thinking about keeping this going and driving impact. But the other part, and I and I think this is critical because I I believe we've got to expand the audience further, right? When we write these pieces and create these things that just make the people that already agree with this issue feel good about themselves, like oh I already knew that I I'm already doing that. that that's not enough. We're, 
clearly as a society, not at a place where we have enough people in, in the room. And so I'm always trying to make media. And I think this goes back to that ecosystem of media that creates a space to have more people come in. I look, look, I, I say, I want tech people in here. I want business leaders in here. I want Republicans in this space. You know, I want faith leaders in here. I wanna know how your values and your tools help get after this issue that I'm sure if you understand it right is one you're gonna care about, right? But we've gotta be able to create spaces and stories and kinds of storytelling that, that gets them in the room because we, we have got to expand audience on this. And I think that's critical. I've got a big star next to ecosystem of media. And I, I worked on a project uh, quite a long time ago uh, that collapsed, but had it worked, what we were going to do is along with the stories we were producing, we were going to do a study guide. And when you think about where conversations happen, because when we talk about siloing of information, in fact, it, in part, it's because of this tribalism that's happened where we're all separated in these tribes and you need to reach within those boundaries in order to get people to listen. And one of those is, is faith-based groups. Uh, when you think about where community conversations happen, it's barbershops and beauty shops, it's also churches. So uh, creating study guides that go with your work that could be spread through uh, uh, the National Council of Churches or other areas that can get out to groups of churches, that's another way to keep those stories moving and, and to provide an education process as well. Jenny, how about you? Yeah, I think it's two parts. One is, uh, you know, again, I'm speaking from experience with the region that I work in. I was just recently working on a story a couple of weeks ago about Lake Charles and the, the disaster recovery that's going on there. And Louisiana was in the cone of uncertainty six or seven times last hurricane season. Hurricane Char or excuse me, Lake Charles and um, Cameron Parish, which is directly south on the coast, um, were decimated. And it's a storm that you know wiped out. It looks like in a war zone going down to Cameron Parish. Um, you know, I went down several weeks ago. It's something that had a lot of hits in the media immediately after, um, but the ongoing recovery process is not something that has been highlighted outside of a couple of local publications um, like Southerly, that's a, a publication that focuses on environment and justice in the South. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm, I will be an advocate of social media once again and being able to use platforms to kind of highlight this work that you're, in, you're engaging in and try to, you know, keep um, momentum building around that. Um, but also, you know, I think that there's something around, um, losing my train of thought, uh, you know, the, the cycle that we're in of celebrating or commemorating certain disasters, like the BP oil spill, Hurricane Katrina, that's when like these stories come up over and over again, rather than thinking kind of critically around what are the systems that are still in place that are, that would allow these same disasters to happen again, or how are they, you know, making the hurricanes and storms that we're, that we're experiencing worse. And certainly that is becoming more and more common in national outlets. Um, but I definitely think that there's still a disaster porn type angle that has to be questioned and is not, you know, benefiting people overall. It's, also, it's one, one other thing is in terms of burnout, and I don't exactly have a fully formed thought around this, but it certainly is something with, um, you know, my generation and my brother who's younger than I am in terms of people feeling like they don't want to still click on these articles or just it's something that has happened, like comes up over and over again in their feeds um, without actually having something tangible to like latch onto to do something about. Um, that gets into the framing issue of it being climate change being an individual problem rather than a systems problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are just, that's food for thought. It's a great way to end. I, I want to get the best practices. I guess this means this is what we're going to have to do for our next session is we'll have to do one on best practices. But uh, uh, the, the idea of disaster porn, it, it, the, it's been consistent over the years in US media, uh, national broadcast media. Uh, on average, it's, uh, environmental news makes up about 2% of their total news coverage. And when you take out the crisis reporting from that, which is the stuff where you don't get 
uh, you get all heat, but not a lot of light, it's much less than uh, uh, 1%. So we need to change that. That's one of the things we need to change within the media ecosystem. Look, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I wish this were conference. Zoom has been great through the pandemic. I wish we were all together because we, I'd love to go out for a beverage and have another six hour conversation with you guys. But thank you so much for being here. Um, and, and I just want to wrap up by, by thanking all of you and, and to thank everyone who's joined us for this. And I know you had a lot of options through here, and I'm grateful you came to see us. If you're interested in our work at the Earth Institute, be sure to look for more information on the Resilience Media Project and Sustain What, which is the work of my partner, Andy Revkin. Again, my thanks to all of you, and I hope you enjoy and find value in the rest of the conference. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much.